Hey, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Still talking about the pandemic, but it seems like it's good news this time. Uh, we've heard from the federal government saying uh, over the weekend that the coronavirus vaccines would be available in Nigeria in about 10 days. And uh, it's Tuesday now, so we should be looking towards the end of the week to have vaccines coming to Nigeria, he says, from about four or five different countries. To discuss this, we've invited Dr. Augustin Epe, who's in the United Kingdom. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. You took the COVID-19 vaccines many weeks ago. I'm sure you've forgotten all about it. But we're just about to receive our first batch here in Nigeria. Are you excited about that? Yes, I am excited that uh, Nigeria is keen into the whole um, COVID vaccine thing, except that I have a couple of reservations. For example, do we have the light to preserve these vaccines in the right temperature? Uh, how much vaccine can we get to vaccinate enough people to give the population, the Nigerian population, herd immunity? So yes, I'm excited, but then I've got reservations here. Well, I, I want you know also go further into those reservations. Um, you, you, of course, you're in a totally different climate, um, a society. Um, what were the things that were you know necessary or were made available first? to ensure that uh, UK citizens and residents were able to you know, get the vaccine that you can already tell we might struggle with here in Nigeria? Yeah, so um, the conversation uh, here was totally different from what we're having now in Nigeria. For example, from procurement, we see that Nigeria is depending on people to donate vaccines and then we are donating out just a few billions to buy vaccines and all of that, which would not be able to supply enough vaccines for the population. But over here, it was a case of producing the vaccine and then paying for the vaccine ahead of time. So yeah, in terms of procurement, there's just a big difference. Like I mentioned earlier, in terms of preservation of these vaccines, the thing is that vaccines have to be preserved within certain temperature ranges. And the COVID vaccine has to be preserved at very, very low temperatures, as low as minus 75 degrees Celsius. And you know, you need power to be able to generate um, in, um, in, uh, that level of freezingness, that level of cold to preserve the vaccine. Well, Nigeria does not even, cannot boast of regular power supply. Uh, so that, that definitely will be an issue for Nigeria, yeah. But the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is uh, very likely what we're receiving, doesn't necessarily need, you know, um, uh, you know that level of, uh, of, ref of uh, oh, temperature, temperature yes. um, um, to store. So does that give us some hope? Yeah, the thing is, is um, the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is not um, up to minus 75 degrees, but then you have to keep vaccines within certain temperatures. The thing is, everything about biology, the human body, vaccines, medicines have to be kept within certain temperature ranges. And you know that Nigeria is in the tropics and just because the AstraZeneca vaccine, I think it's about a minus two or so degrees yeah. Celsius, I'm not sure now. Just because it's not, it doesn't require something very low doesn't mean that you don't need to keep it within the required temperature range. So what? power is an issue in Nigeria, like we all know, and we know how government works in Nigeria. So yeah, I think that um, Nigeria might struggle to really preserve the vaccines here. Yeah. What is the biggest um, fear or what, you know, what could be the biggest danger? Um, for us, if we fail to keep those vaccines at you know the right temperature, um, what happens when the vaccines are no longer effective? You know, is that now dangerous to the human body? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. The thing is, if the vaccines do not stay within the temperature they need to stay in, then they will not be effective anymore, and then the purpose of vaccination will be defeated. So, vaccination is aimed at generating immunity in the human body. Usually when diseases come to the body, uh, come invade the body, the body tries to understand what organism it is and try to produce its own defense system specific to that particular pathogen, whatever it is, be it a virus or a, a, a bacteria that comes into the body system. So when you vaccinate people, what you're doing is you're giving them the same thing or at least the active part of whether the virus, the virus or the bacteria, and then you're saying to the body, here is the kind of thing that can likely infect you, study it, produce antibodies, produce defense mechanisms against this kind of pathogen, this virus in this case. So the thing is, if you have um, vaccines that are not within 
optimum ranges of preservation in terms of temperature, in terms of other, other factors as well, their shape will be altered. So the body cannot study them. The body cannot get the right shape that it should get to be able to prepare the right defense. So the purpose of vaccination will be defeated ultimately. And we know that the purpose of vaccination is to generate immunity. So why, why um, give, give vaccines if they are not going to be effective anyway? Mm. And still talking about vaccines and their effectiveness, we've heard from, you know, global health bodies, health experts, and even for these vaccines, the clinical trials they've conducted, they tell you just how much percent, you know, immunity these vaccines can give you. And it's not even immunity, so to speak, is it? And you never hear a 100% guarantee that you would never get COVID, never transmit it, or never get it again. So really, I, I want us to understand the essence of COVID-19 vaccination, despite the fact that you are still likely to get COVID. I mean, I listened to uh, the health minister of uh, Australia yesterday, and we're hearing talks about the fact that you can get vaccinated for COVID-19, but you, you will still get COVID, or you might still get COVID, but it won't just be as severe. So for the common man, help us understand why we still need to get vaccinated if we can still get COVID, but it won't be so bad. Exactly, so the thing is this, um, one of the primary purposes of vaccination is to save lives. So if ordinarily, if one is exposed to say the COVID vaccine and there's a risk that th that person might die from the infection and you have something that you can do to reduce that risk, something statistically significant that can reduce that risk, I think it's sensible to take your chances. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what, one of the things vaccination does is to reduce the impact of diseases. It doesn't necessarily mean all the time that you will not get sick with that disease, even though there are some instances where one can get sick with the disease. And let me just quickly say that at the moment, a lot is still being studied in regards to COVID and COVID vaccines. Yes, the, the power job has been done in terms of the preparation of the vaccine and then the research and everything. But you know, sometimes you have to look out for long-term sequelae and long-term effects to know what would be the long-term effect of these vaccines and all of that. So yeah, one of the advantages of vaccination, therefore, is that you can reduce the impact of the disease and thereby you can reduce the number of deaths from, from um, COVID in this, in, this, in this case. So the point basically yeah. is risk reduction, not, not that you're entirely immune from ever getting COVID or getting sick. No, no not at all. In fact, okay. if, you, if you get the vaccine, you can get COVID, you can even, interestingly, you can even spread the virus. But the thing is, if you have been vaccinated and you have immunity against COVID, so you will not get a very serious COVID infection, you okay. probably get a mild one or even be asymptomatic. Even when you spread it to your neighbor who has also had vaccine, that person would get the infection. Ordinarily, perhaps that person should be in the high risk group and should suffer from getting that um, for getting COVID, but because they have been vaccinated as well, they will be protected. So yeah, it's just risk reduction basically. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's now also talk, um, we're expecting it, uh, well, it was 10 days um, that was said a couple of days ago. Uh, so two things I want you to, you to quickly speak on. The um, people who you feel you know, must receive the vaccine first, um, what was it like in the, in the UK? Was it frontline workers? Was it the elderly? Do you think it should be the same thing here in Nigeria? And then second, the government, I believe, has a lot of work to do with the conspiracy theories against the vaccine. The traditional, the religious, the cultural, you know, theories that have over time, you know, worked against, you know, proper vaccination. How do you think we can also deal with that? Yeah, so um, first of all, to talk about the people who should get the vaccines first. In theory, and as it happened in Senate clients like um, where, where we live, usually frontline workers, especially those at risk of getting the COVID infection, particularly serious infection, should be treated, should get the vaccines first. People who are at high risk of getting severe um, infection, COVID infection, should also get the vaccine as, as early as possible. But let me quickly say that it's not enough to say what um, um, group of people in the, in the society should get vaccines and things like that. Like I, quick, I, I keep um, talking about each time I get the opportunity, there's what we call the herd immunity threshold. That is the number of people who, who should get the vaccines in the population for us to say we have sensibly vaccinated the population. It's not enough to say let's get, give um, maybe first one million people who are at high risk and all that. Because the, the thing is, if you do not get the 
head threshold, if you do not get enough people to get vaccinated, um, the vaccination exercise will not be effective. In terms of the conspiracy theory and, and all of that, um, I must say that Nigeria is in a very difficult situation um, because, you know, we are quite sentimental, a right? sentimental group of people. Uh, and with the whole religious thing and, and, and the way the whole COVID thing played out, it would be a very, very difficult um, thing to do. But then what you're doing now is the right thing, what your station is doing, advocating for vaccines to be taken, educating the population, because the only way we can actually get people to have a rethink about vaccination is to actually get educated. Okay, yeah. uh, well, I'll come back to you in just a few minutes, Mr. Ekwe, but let's bring in Okpe Yemi Orinowo. He works with the Mutala Mohammed Foundation. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you. All thank right, you so we've been talking about the COVID-19 vaccines and uh, of, of course, the federal government has been making promises, you know, saying the COVID-19 vaccines are expected in Nigeria by the end of January, by February. And now we've heard just another news that before the end of the week, before the end of the month, we'll have COVID-19 vaccines in Nigeria. Are you optimistic about that? Or do you think, you know, we just might get another uh, postponement in the future? I mean, if, if we just go by analyzing the way in which they've gone about it and the and uncertainty that has you know clouded the information dissemination process, I mean, it's been one news to the other contradicting each other, starting from when we we're even first expecting the 100,000 Pfizer uh, um, um, vaccine. And we, I turned out later on that we, they said we're not expecting that and it's the AstraZeneca one that we're not expecting. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to do as far as information. I mean, there's no point turning information out to the public if these things have not been verified. So it seems as if they just have, if the first meeting they have with potential suppliers, they rush to the public right now to come and announce wrong information. So if I go by their pattern, I rather not want to get my hopes tied. Let's wait. When they arrive, let's know that, okay, now they've touched down at our cargo airports. Okay. All right. There's um, um, something that um, Augustine Ekpe also mentioned, and that is uh, with herd immunity, and uh, I don't know if it's right to say herd vaccination also. Uh, and that is the need to get as many people vaccinated so that you can say that your vaccination process um, has been successful. Um, what is the likelihood of Nigeria reaching those numbers? Uh, because we're 200 million people. Uh, we can be talking about 100,000 vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, it means we need millions and millions and millions of vaccines. What is the likelihood, seeing the way that things have played out so far? Well, if we go if we go by the information that the, the recent information, I think what we're expecting now for the AstraZeneca is about 15 to 16 million thereabout. And I know that uh, based on another communication that was released, there is still another 40 million that is expected from the African Union. So there are a, quite, there've been quite a lot of information throwing out different numbers out at, uh, of expected vaccine at different times produced by different countries. In fact, the last communication now sees, uh, reflects that I think we're expecting vaccine for about five different countries. I can't be precise to say, okay, this is the total number, but I don't think, every, I don't think all of the expect, or expected vaccine is up to f half of our population. So I think the real conversation should be about, I mean, the AstraZeneca virus, I mean, vaccine has been licensed to South Africa. South Africa is the only country right now who is having the capacity to produce that vaccine. So let's even say we cannot create in the first instance. Are we saying we cannot even imitate? We can't just get a blueprint to say, okay, this is how a vaccine is produced and put the right infrastructure in place to be able to manufacture them. So, I mean, these are issues that are, that are that call for. At the end of the day, if we're really going to get that 100% vaccination, and if you look at the investments that is required to put in, I mean, it will make sense that between now and the next two, three months, what does it take right now to, to, to put in place the capacity to produce. Mm. So I would expect that a forward-thinking government to start to look in this direction. Indeed, Orino, South Africa has the license to produce the uh, Johnson and Johnson COVID-19 vaccines, the only country in Africa at the moment. But looking at all the factors that inhibit this, I mean, we don't even have the vaccine, so we can't even begin to talk about getting licensed to make them in the first place. Let's look at all the, the, the stereotypes or the myth that, you know, this COVID-19 vaccine is shrouded in. We spoke earlier about how, you know, Nigerians had resistance to the polio vaccine and all the yes. other vaccines we've had. And now for the coronavirus vaccines, what, what sort of misinformation have you heard on the ground or working with your foundation regarding COVID-19 that you feel these are the kind of things that is limiting government's efforts, you know, in making sure that everyone is enlightened and on the same page regarding vaccination? Okay, so I, I want to liken 
the scenario to the same thing we had in the 80s regarding polio. If you recall, I, I, I could recall that the government had to spend a lot of money taking leaders, especially within the, in the northern region, abroad to take them on conferences to enlighten them because it was being interpreted then that maybe the polio, vi the polio vaccine at the time was very contradictory to their religious beliefs. So because of the heterogeneous nature of our population and the fact that when it comes to literacy level, our literacy level is still very, very low. I mean, we still having to have, we still have the conflict between orthodox medicine and, 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 the, and medicine, and medicine as science bias backed uh, medicine. So we will expect that vaccine, in, in the first instance, as a, as a, based on our own telemedicine platform, we have a situation people don't even believe in the, in the, in the reality of COVID-19. Who we'll see that maybe there's an elitist component, maybe the government's just using it to siphon money. The seriousness of, of COVID-19 is not even down at the grassroots level. So as far as information is concerned, what we expect is a situation whereby at the very lowest level, there's a recruitment process to get the community gatekeepers, the kings, the, the eologers, the coordinators, those, those people right now, who the people at the very bottom, at the very grassroots level respect. Whatever information that comes out from them right now is being taken seriously. How many people really take a government official serious in Nigeria anymore? How many people take the PTF seriously? But there are Nigerians right now who do not own, 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 own any Taitsu, but they have that social capital to be able to influence people to say, okay, this is the direction, this is good. So we need to put some efforts within that. There's a need right now for a cross-cutting approach to communication. Okay. We need to make it hybrid, it's bring horrible. traditional rulers involved, bring community leaders, market people, bring everybody involved. All right, Mr. Rooney, well, uh, let's bring in Mr. Epe here. You've taken the COVID-19 vaccine. I want you to speak to Nigerians, millions of them and even Africans are listening to you right now. How do you feel? Do you feel weird? Do you feel different? I want you to be as basic as possible because the stereotype, the myth surrounding COVID-19 vaccine is so strong. We need to break those strongholds really. Since you took the vaccine, have you felt any different? Um, well, since I took the vaccine, I've not felt any different at all. Just mild pain at the site of the vaccination, and that was it. So I want to say that these vaccines were properly and thoroughly researched, even though they came out in, in such a short time. But science has advanced so much that now you don't need to wait for 10 years to be able to produce a vaccine. So the vaccines are safe. They are effective from the studies that have been done, even though long-term um, overviews are still ongoing. Uh, like, like, has been said, like it has been said, I took the vaccine and I'm here, I've been here, and I will continue to be here. So it is safe when the vaccine comes to Nigeria, hoping that the Nigerian government will do the right thing in terms of making sure that these vaccines are kept under the conditions that they should be kept. Please take the vaccine. Luckily, we uh, already have a 10 billionaire that has been voted for, you know, for producing vaccines. So hopefully that will be put to good use and, um, um, you know, we will make the best out of it. Um, I'm going to go back quickly to Mr. Okweemi. Um, you're here in Nigeria. And so I, I want your thoughts on how the Nigerian government can also battle the possibility of fake vaccines being produced and sold here in Nigeria. I'm expecting that we will, you know, very likely get into, you know, a situation like that where people would start making their own vaccines and, you know, selling off. How can we fight that? Okay, so the, the, it, it has to, I think the first approach would be consequence. In the first instance, what we're dealing with right now is an epidemic. And to think that some people will go through the, to the length of profiteering from this thing in such a way that even puts people in danger. In the first instance, what, what it takes in terms of the infrastructure required, just like the other speaker just, just adduced to, what it takes right now to even keep a well-produced uh, vaccine, what it takes right now to keep it safe and keep it healthy for, for human beings, it, it requires so much infrastructure. A certain temperature must be kept. So if, you, so if somebody will go all the other way, I think it's important right now the government enlighten people to know what it is, you know, how to differentiate what from what. And I, I want to believe that in the same way they've addressed COVID testing, they are accredited centers. So people understand that these are the XYZ number of people who are authorized to even issue the a COVID vaccine in the first instance. Secondly, there has to be information broken down in all languages, informing people on how to differentiate right or wrong. Thirdly, there has to be serious consequence. There has to be some serious consequences for such scenarios. All right. All right.
right. Thank you very much, uh, Okoyemi Oruno, uh, the coordinator of uh, the Mutala Mohammed Foundation, and Dr. Augustin Ekbe, who joins us from the UK. Thank you for having me. Have a great Thank you. No, it's going to be, it's, it's, it, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to play some level of control over uh, the vaccination period here in Nigeria, mostly because of, you know, we have very peculiar situations that always arise um, where people try to take advantage of Nigerians and the vulnerable and the poor. I mentioned it the um, other day. Um, I know somebody Nigerians. who claims to have taken a COVID-19 vaccine that his sister shipped from somewhere. Yeah, there, there's always going to be stuff like that. And um, Okpeyemi also mentioned that it's important that there is some uh, punitive measures um, and very, very strong punitive yes. measures against uh, things like that. that. But also remember that the same people who were selling fake COVID-19 results are the people that you should trust, actually, to give you um, a legitimate COVID-19 test and, and results. So True. who then do you give that level of trust then in the country to ensure that the vaccines that are being sold and are being given are the right vaccines? I fear also that we might get into a place where people then say, well, how are we sure that the vaccines are still safe? We don't even have good electricity in Nigeria to preserve these vaccines. Mm. How I think we you sure can only hold on to the safe? words of the, uh, you know, of, of the government. They said they, they have all the required facilities. They put all, all storage mm. necessary uh, in place. I'm, I'm really just we stating just hold, you know, hold on to that. reasons why, you know, because of you know, the way that we've run the government over, the, over uh, time, it makes it harder to achieve these things. So th these things really and shouldn't be rocket science. Yeah. Um, South Africa now has gone to a place where they can even produce vaccines. I believe, I'm sure that South Africans themselves will trust their government to give them, you know, vaccines. True. But because of these little, little loopholes that we've, you know, mismanaged over time, it makes it more difficult for the Nigerian government to go through a process that normally should be very, very seamless. Indeed. Um, get the vaccine from AstraZeneca, store them for, for a while, look for who needs, who needs the vaccines, create a proper logistics for distribution of these vaccines to even you know, the rural areas. And other countries have shown it is possible. But really. we have, by ourselves, created these loopholes, created opportunities for conspiracy theorists, created opportunities for people who, for mischief makers who want to make money off, um, off, um, off sick Nigerians. Indeed. Um, so everybody needs to be on their feet at a time like this. NAFDAQ will have to be on their feet. Security yes. agencies will have to be on their feet. The uh, PTF has to be on their feet. Everybody needs to be on their feet. And of course, the public enlightenment aspect of these, you know, vaccine period, the National Orientation Agency, which, you know, has not been really, really active in the last decade, um, needs to also step in here. And I, only, I will really suggest that they take social media very seriously because that's where we get lots of our information these days and people can be very easily fooled, very easily misinformed. So they need to take social media seriously such that they can dis disseminate the information to the people who they need to reach the most. Absolutely. Yes, I think uh, that's, that's all we have for you today on The Breakfast. We hope you've enjoyed every bit of the conversation beginning with uh, electricity tariff. How much will you build last month for electricity you can share that with us on our social media platform it's at plus tv africa are you considering prepaid meters we also spoke about the nddc and the 6.25 billion naira covid19 palliative fraud and now the covid19 vaccines that we expect before the end of february so yes thank you very much for watching my name is Aneta felix and with me i am osao Ogbon. see you tomorrow the news comes up next at uh, 9 a.m yes that's bye for now bye bye